titled this morning's message, Hope for the Future. And uh, we're going to be reading out of Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to read uh, verses 10 through 14. Amen. Good word. All right, Jeremiah chapter 29, starting at verse 10. If you got your Bibles, we got it up on the screen if you don't. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me. When you, shall search, when you shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, says the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places, whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So this passage of scripture is being spoken and it's written down the words of the prophet Jeremiah, also known as the weeping prophet. As a matter of fact, if you just go to Jeremiah chapter 9, uh, verse 1, I'll just show you the passage of scripture. He's known by scholars, he's known by people that study the Bible as the weeping prophet. And the reason that uh, he was known as the weeping prophet is because of this passage of scripture right here. He says, oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. What the, the story behind it was, was that Israel was now uh, was on their way to captivity during the, pro, during the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah. And he saw the destruction, he saw the disobedience of God's people, and his heart was connected to it. You know, uh, more so really it seems than any other prophet, his heart was connected to the people, his heart was connected to the heart of God, and it was like he was feeling what they were feeling, and he was seeing the pain of God's people. And so because of that, he's known as the weeping prophet. Now, many times I, I, I'm all about context, uh, if you, if and many of you know that, but I like to try to tell the story, God's story. And so that's why I do this oftentimes. And I know that many of you are very familiar with me doing this, but some people may not be. I like us to know where we are in the midst of the Bible. And some people have studied or read the Bible. If you've never read the Bible all the way through, it makes it sometimes difficult to understand exactly where you are in the Bible, right? And i got to be honest with you, I was a Christian for 12 years before I ever read the Bible all the way through. Um, so I encourage you to do that, but that's one of the reasons why I do this repeatedly so that we kind of like, I'm hoping that with re repetition that we learn some things about the overall idea of the Bible. So the reason I start with the fall, I know that the Bible starts with creation, amen, but the reason I start with the fall is because that's when the story of redemption begins, God's story of redemption. And really, if you look at it, the Bible, the Bible is a book that tells the story of God of redemption. What does redemption mean? It means a purchasing back, a buying back. Now, when we add the concept of creation and we look at the overall scriptures, we understand that God had a purpose. He has a purpose and a plan. And his purpose and his plan is to create an eternal family. God desires to have relationship with us. Amen. Sometimes I've said it before. I've wondered why even the King David wondered why. It seems as though in one of the Psalms, he looks in, the, in, in his reflection and he wonders, who is man that you're even mindful of him? And, you know, hey, the great King David. And so I think that sometimes in our own lives, we probably wonder, Lord, why are you even mindful of me after all that? But if you've ever experienced the love of God in your life, you know that he is mindful of you. Amen. And that's actually one of my points this morning. God's thinking about you. Yes. Amen. And so I want you to know, though, that the plan of redemption. And, and so, like, right after the fall, uh, it's not long afterwards that not is it just an, a singular event where Adam and Eve failed God, but that. Now the sin has spread rampantly through the entirety of the earth. And because of that, God's judgment had to come upon the earth because corporately mankind was completely away from the will of God. And sin was too much, really, there was so much going on, we don't have time to get into it. But it was just so bad and so heinous that God started over from scratch, right? And not long after that, we know that the Tower of Babel takes place. Once again, corporate rebellion. I don't want to get into the... 
grand scheme of things and how the enemy through wicked men and corrupt nations and you know the spirit of antichrist has been trying to move upon the earth and accomplish the same plan to destroy humanity many times i'm just going to be truthful with you many times we observe the scriptures from our own context what are you talking about preacher i'm saying we i learned this word back when i was in nursing school it's called egocentric what does it mean centered around self we center our world around ourself Oh, ain't nobody got it going on as bad as me, preacher. Uh, I'm the only one that really has experienced some painful circumstances. No, you're not. Now, we've all experienced pain, right? As a matter of fact, back in the day when I used to go preach in the, in the jailhouse, and sometimes I kind of miss that. But I've said that before. We won't get into it. But because it was a simple time. When, you know, the ones that wanted to hear the gospel came to the little to the little tray hole right there. And, and, you know, I can tell you that I would tell them many times we may not have like, everything in common. You might not even know the Jesus I come to preach to you this morning. But we got one thing in common. I guarantee you. we can have two, but we definitely got one. What is that? We were both born of Adam. Each and every person in this room was born of Adam. Each and every person in that jail was born of Adam. And because of that, they have experienced sin and they have experienced the effects of a sinful life and that it can cause pain. Even if you were raised in the church, sometimes that's even worse. Sometimes it's hard for people raised in the church to even really, you know, what I'm, you understand what I'm saying. But even if you've been raised in the, in the church, you have still experienced the pain of this fallen earth because the people that you've been around are fallen. And people don't do what they're supposed to do. And newsflash, even if you were raised in the church, there's many times you haven't done what you were supposed to do towards your fellow man. You've caused your own share of pain. You've caused trial and tribulation in other people's lives. Lord knows I have. I wish it weren't true, but it is, right? And so, but right here, you know, listen, so mankind corporately and the spirit of antichrist is, is trying to, to cause confusion and that's how I got off on that rabbit trail. I wanted to say that so often we're egocentric. We look at self. We think, but God's got a big old plan he's working. Amen? He's big enough to handle it. But he's got a big plan. It's called salvation history. It's called, I'm going to not only save mankind, but I'm going to destroy my enemy. The one who elevated himself above me and said that he was going to establish his own throne and, and I threw him out of the heavenly realm and, and there's coming a day when I will lock him up in a bottomless pit for a thousand years and, and then after that there's coming a day when he will be destroyed in a place called the lake of fire also known in the Greek as Gehenna it's going to happen but in the meantime I'm doing a work on this earth, amen, and I'm establishing my kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not established in the physical yet, meaning Jesus isn't sitting on a throne in Jerusalem yet, but he's sitting on the throne inside of his people's hearts, amen, and God is establishing a kingdom. But not only that, he does care about you amen. individually, right. amen. Even though, even despite our egocentrism, yes. he does love us, amen. he cares about us as individuals, and he wants to intervene in the midst of our lives, amen. amen. The reason I brought up Babel is because that's what that was. Another corporate rebellion against God. A plan to come against the plan of God. We don't have time to get into all that. But one of the most beautiful things to me, and I say it all the time, is that when you change the page and you go from chapter 11 to chapter 12 of Genesis, you're introduced to this man named Abraham. And God had a plan for Abraham. And through that man, ultimately, he created the nation of Israel, right? We know that. We know that Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had two sons, and Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and, J and Israel's 12 sons were the 12 tribes of Israel, and from those boys, God created a nation called Israel, amen, and through that nation, hallelujah, the ultimate plan of God, he had it planned the whole time. I mean, you can reach all the way back to the garden incident right after the fall, and you can hear the message that God preached to the serpent and to Adam and to Eve, and you know that he had the same plan in effect. Don't ever tell me it's not about the cross. Don't ever tell me you got to get past the cross, because if you're saying that, then you don't know what the scriptures are saying. From the beginning until the end, 
Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, the Bible says Adam and Eve tried to clothe themselves with the with fig leaves, with the work of their own hands, trying to sew together fig leaves in order to cover their nakedness, which was typifying the fact that they were uncovered and exposed before God, and they weren't in right relationship with Him, and God said, that's not going to work. It's going to require skins. It will require the shedding of blood of an innocent animal, a bystander that had nothing to do with the sin that you committed and God clothed them with skins. Redemption purchased through the shedding of blood from the beginning until the end. The Bible says John the revelator and, the, and whenever he's in the throne and he begins to weep because nobody on the earth was worthy to open up the scroll and one of the elders comes to him and says, why do you weep? He says, nobody's worthy. There's nobody worthy on the earth. In, in the heavens, nobody's worthy. He says, don't weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy. He's Amen. worthy to open the scroll. He said, I turn to look to see. He's looking for a lion. And what he sees is a lamb as though it had been slain. Amen. So hallelujah. You can't tell me that it's not about Calvary because it's from the beginning and it's all the way to the end. And if it weren't for the cross, you and I would not even be able to have a relationship with him. You and I wouldn't be able to have our lives restored. You and I wouldn't even have a hope for the future. I'm here to tell you this morning, this morning that there's a hope for the future. And God created through this man named Abraham a nation called Israel. And through that nation, he gave us the Messiah. That wasn't his last name. He gave us the Christ. That wasn't his last name. That was his title. He was the promised one. He would redeem humanity from their sin. God had this plan. He's been working it. We might not be able to see it. Sometimes we're blinded to what God's doing, but I'm here to tell you, he knows what he's doing. Amen. And we'll just trust him. And I'm not telling you it's easy. Sometimes it gets hard. This life is painful. It hurts sometimes. Come on, help me out here. Amen. I'm not the only one that's experienced pain. But if we would hold on to him, Amen. if we would trust him right. and hope in him, yeah. Amen. he's going to get it done. Amen. Amen. And so he created this nation called Israel. We'll just start there or pick up there. He created this nation called Israel. And he had a great king. You remember that king? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll bypass Saul. He made, but he had a great king named David. Oh, it was a beautiful day. When that young shepherd boy, I'm kind of going off, when that young shepherd boy came in from the field, amen, and they poured that hot oil all over his head, and he was anointed to be the next king, amen, and he had a son named Solomon, and then everything went south. People don't like me to talk about Solomon like this, but I'm just here to tell you that if you got a problem with what I'm about to say, you need to go back and read the Bible. Solomon made some grievous mistakes. Yes. The wisest man, the Bible t claims him to be the wisest man that ever walked on the face of the earth went contrary to the will of God, connected himself to foreign women, and they drove his heart away from God. And it caused such a repercussion in the kingdom of God that God split the kingdom of Israel in two. The northern kingdom known as Israel, still holding that name. The lower kingdom known as Judah, which is where we get the idea from Jews. Jews come from Judah. And the kingdom was split. And from that time moving forward, the kings followed after the kings of Israel specifically, but also it began to affect Judah. The kings began to cheat on God. They would, like Solomon before them, embrace the idolatry of the foreign nations. It was all mixed up. I have to tell you that the same spirit that caused that confusion then is still alive and well today in the modern church. And I'm not picking on the modern church. I'm not going to sit here and pick on a whole bunch of your preachers. I mean, I say your preachers. I don't know who you listen to. I'm not going to pick. I'm not going to necessarily do that and start throwing out a bunch of names this morning. The Lord knows I'm not scared to do that. But what I am going to do is say that the same spirit that was alive then is alive today in the modern church. And much of what you turn on the television is not even the gospel. They're not even preaching the truth of the gospel. They're preaching some money-hungry message. They're preaching some hyper-faith, word-of-faith message. Oh, you don't have a word of faith? Of course I got a word of faith. I got a word of faith. Jesus is my, my object of my faith. Jesus died on the cross and giving me access to the grace of God in the midst of a fallen world to receive peace and strength from God is my faith. Amen. Not some uh, pie in the sky. I'm going to speak. We're going to talk about that this morning too. I'm going to speak what I want to get from God and he's going to do it because his word says it. 
and he's not a man that he's going to lie. I'm going to hold you accountable, God, to your word, and you're going to do what I ask of you. That's not, that, that, Don't tell me that's not what they think because I've read all their stuff. You might not have, but I have. And I'm not saying that there's not a good one in there. Many of them are probably deceived themselves, but that ain't the word of God. You don't hold God accountable to his word. He holds you accountable right. to his word. And if you think you're going to hold him accountable to his word, you don't understand his word. If you can find out what it's really saying, he will move in your circumstance. Yeah. He will do what he said he would do. Amen. But you're, you're not going to demand it of him. Yeah. No. Well, how, will the potter contend with the, will the clay contend with the potter? No, he's the potter. We're the clay. He's molding us. And unfortunately, like, a, like Jeremiah, when he went down to the potter's house, what was wrong with the clay? It was all marred. It was all thrown off. It was all messed up. God has to start all over again, amen, and begin to mold. But So the kingdom was split, Israel and Judah, and the kings began to worship idolatrously, leading the people into idolatrous worship. But God was faithful and would give prophets. Amen. Prophets that would speak the truth, bring warning, give a word of restoration and say, hey, God's got a plan. We need to repent of the ways that we're going and we need to come back unto him. Amen. And so within that time frame, we have the prophet Jeremiah who speaks the word that we're listening to this morning. All right. And then. There's a 70-year period. It said it in the passage that we spoke of. That 70-year period of captivity was going to take place. God said it through Jeremiah. 70 years is how long this situation is going to last. 70 years of captivity. And he has a plan. Amen. And so Israel is facing all of this. And there's other prophets after that. But I just wanted you to see that basically this is the context of where we are in Jeremiah's ministry, what's going on. In the beginning of his ministry, his calling was really took place in the midst of a, of a little bit of a glimmer of hope. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that about 12 years, he was called into ministry at about the 12th year of Josiah, the king's calling as a king. Josiah was a breath of fresh air. He, he shooting from the hip, he, uh, he, was, he was anointed and appointed king at eight years old. And there came a time during Josiah's ministry that they accidentally stumbled on the, the law in the temple. And they began to read it after he was a little bit older. I think he was about 16 years old. He began to read the law of God. And he began to look at the horrendous sin that was taking place. As a matter of fact, we can't even, I'm not even preaching about Josiah this morning. This is a passage out of Jeremiah. But Josiah was such an awesome king. You can't even really bypass the things that he did. We really need to go and read a little bit of it. We will in a second. 2 Kings chapter 22 if you want to get ready. But that was when Jeremiah was called by God. But for 50 years, I mean, jo Josiah lived and died and went on with the Lord. And as much as Josiah desired to make things right that had been made wrong, it never really entered into the people's hearts. They continued on in their ways. And whenever Jeremiah writes this passage of scripture, well, towards the end of, of his life anyway, whenever it's all said and done, Jeremiah ends up in exile in Egypt. The kings are exiled to Babylon and Jerusalem is in shambles. Even before all of that happens is when God gives this word to Jeremiah. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts. To give you an expected end, which really means a future and a hope. The thoughts that I think towards you are thoughts of peace, not of evil. He tells them that even before they find themselves in the worst of times, in the worst of destruction, 70 years this is going to take place, 70 years of captivity, and then I'm going to bring you back. Amen. Before it ever happens, it's a word of hope. I got to tell you that many times people have quoted this passage of scripture wrong. They just quoted it. Not, it's not important how they quoted it. But what I want you to know is this, is that if you quoted this scripture before in a time of your life of uncertainty, in a time of your life where there was confusion or chaos, in a time of your life whenever there was pain, and you said, Lord, your word says, you know the thoughts that you think towards me. Thoughts of good and not of evil. 
Thoughts that you want to give me a future and a hope. Thoughts that you want to give me peace. That you quoted it at exactly the right time because that's Amen. the exact context that God is speaking to his people Israel in this passage of scripture. And so by a rediscovery once again of the copy of the Mosaic law that was in the temple, Josiah finds this pa these passages of scripture and for 31 years he begins to clean house and bring some level of stability to Israel. If we go to 2 Kings chapter 22, I'm going to uh, try to read some of that to you real quick. I, I mean, you could really read the whole chapter, um, but I, I just felt like that would be way too long. So what, what I wanted to do was, if I could find the right spot, I just highlighted some, we're going to read chapter 22 verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go towards the end of the chapter. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and 1 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right or to the left. So what you got to understand, there's so much information in that little bit of passage that we just read right there. David was a man after God's own heart. I know what he did. You know what he did. The reason David was a man after God's own heart was because he was never going to worship a false idol. He, he loved God. And people that love God make mistakes. People that love God commit sin. People that love God fall down, but guess what? They get back up. Yeah. David loved God with all of his heart, and he determined in his heart that he was going to serve the Lord. Solomon went a way that God was not pleased with, and it caused untold Problems, And if you go back and you read in the Kings, what you'll see is he did that which was wrong, like his father Solomon or Jeroboam that was after Solomon. This king did evil in the sight of the Lord like Jeroboam or like Solomon. And time and again, but what it's saying is Josiah, he took the throne at eight and he did what was right, like his father David before him. David was a type of Christ. David was a type of the one who would make things right. Amen. <laughs> and so if we move on in chapter 22 to. Um, let's see if it's 22. It's actually 23. Chapter 23, Second Kings 23. I'm going to read verse 15. But I want to tell you before we do that. That one of the things that happened. If you'll remember Ahab and Jezebel. You remember them? You've heard of those names before? If you haven't, let me just tell you, he was a wicked king. He married this wicked woman, and she had prof the prophets of Baal that sat at her table during the ministry of Elijah the prophet. And they did some of the most grievous things. They took the idolatry of the world, and they brought it into the temple. I mean, it was bad. I mean, I, I'm one of these preachers, and I'm not scared to tell you what. what back, back then, them pagan people... They took trees and they carved them into the shape of a male's uh, anatomy and they worshiped that. And, and there was a time in Israel's history whenever they brought that into the temple and they were worshiping that instead of worshiping God. And this is the kind of stuff that's going on. Now, now one of the scary things, and I got to tell you that it's kind of like the frog in the water situation. Whenever you put the frog in the water and then you light the fire afterwards, he becomes acclimated to his environment. He doesn't even realize that he's knee deep in a mess, if you know what I'm saying. I believe, unfortunately, that much of that kind of thing happens even in the modern church. That we're being groomed to believe that certain things are Christianity and certain things are the gospel. And it's been going on for so long that many of us were actually saved underneath some of that false doctrine. And it's been around so long that we're under the impression that this is what church is supposed to look like. And I'm here to tell you, when you line up what they're telling you the church is supposed to look like to the scriptures, the two are not congruent with one another. There are two different things going on here. Th this had been going on for so long in Israel's history, they didn't even really know any better. And when you read the, the, the teachings of scholars, they will tell you that Israel had this form of worship that was so intermingled with paganism, they didn't even know what their true faith even looked like. But whenever Josiah, Josiah found the law and he began to read it, he's like, what we're seeing here and what it says here, these two things aren't lining up. And if you read in verse 15 of chapter 23... It just talks about some of the things. I mean, it, we've already missed. We skipped so much of what he did. But I just want you to see here. It says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place 
which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place he broke down. You remember the story of Jeroboam? I've shared that with y'all many times. He's the one that came after Solomon. He said, I got I to gotta come up with a plan. <laughs> if I don't come up with a plan, then the people of God are going to go down to Jerusalem and worship, and I'm going to lose them. I need to hold them under bondage. So what he did was, up at the top of the nation, this is, this is Israel. Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea, Jordan River, Israel here. Up here, there was a place called Dan, and about right here, there was a place called Bethel. He put a golden calf here, and he put number two over here. Two golden calves. calves. And, and this is what he told Israel. Israel, this is the God that delivered you out of Egypt. <laughs> 500 or so years after the deliverance from Egypt, after Aaron said, poof, somehow this gold turned into a golden calf out of the fire, Jeroboam builds two altars and says, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. And the people would go there to worship false gods. And when Josiah read the law, and he saw what was going on. He went on a tear and just started ripping things apart, burning things and making things right. And that was one of them he did. He tore down that altar and it says, and he burned the high place and he stamped it to small powder and he burned the grove. I mean, he burned it up and he's stomping it and he's, he's making it. And he's like, oh, he's all righteous anger. And he, and, he, and he burned the grove. With the word grove, if you look it up in the Hebrew, that's Asher, Asherah pole. That's that thing I was telling you about. They're all over the place. I hate, I always get scared to do this, but that's the Washington Monument. I hate to tell you that. But anyway, that's another story. It's, what I'm trying to tell you is the Spirit's still alive. The Spirit's still alive, still trying to cause confusion, still trying to pull God's people away, putting blinders over our eyes. Most people don't even know it. But anyway, it says that Josiah turned himself and he spied the sepulchres. And so after he stomped all that stuff to powder, the Bible says he turned himself and he, he saw the sepulchers, tombs. Now if you go back to another passage of scripture, the idea is it's the tombs of them priests that used to offer up sacrifice to them two golden calves. Now they've been long dead and buried and Josiah, he said, I spy their tombs. Go, go rip them bones out of them graves and let's burn them bones on their false altar. I mean, he was mad and he was angry. And can you imagine what a beautiful time to start your ministry if you're the prophet Jeremiah? I mean, we got a revolution going on, right? This king loves the Lord. He's only 16, if I'm not mistaken. He was 16 when he started doing all of this. And, and, and Jeremiah started his prophecy his ministry at this point in time. And I just wanted to point that out to you. Unfortunately, at the end of Jeremiah's ministry, like we've already said, he's exiled to Egypt. The kings are deported to Babylon. Jerusalem's in shambles because the people's heart were never changed as hard as Josiah desired to try. Uh, the people continued to worship false gods. Yet even before all this takes place, God gives a word of hope. He gives a word of hope. That even though you find yourselves in the midst of this captivity, 70 years is how long it's going to last. And then it's going to be over. If you've ever looked at the place where you are in your life, and once again, you quoted this passage of scripture, you quoted it just the way it was supposed to be quoted. God used Jeremiah to give this word of hope to his people at a time when there seemed to be no hope. I have good news for you this morning to let you know that God still holds hope in his hand. And while you may not feel any right now, I can tell you that if you won't let go of him, in the end, hope will be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. It may not be the way you expected it. It might not even be the way that you wanted it. But in the end, hope, if you hold on to the Lord, will be fulfilled. Amen. It will be the fulfillment of his hope. And I can tell you that it will be really, really good. Amen? Amen? Some things that God wants his people to know when they're waiting on that hope. Amen? Uh, while they're waiting on that hope and it doesn't look like there's, any, like there's any hope anywhere around. Number one. Point number one when you're waiting on the hope of God to show up is you need to know this. This is temporary. Amen. It's important that you understand that. The situation that you're in, the situation that you're facing right now is temporary. I know it's easier said than it is to receive, but you got to understand the situation is temporary. 
It's so often that we find ourselves in the midst of this fallen earth. We find that the circumstances and the pain, it makes things appear hopeless. But what we have to remember is that things change. More importantly, we have to remember that God changes things. Amen. He changes things for his people. Now, I do need you to know this also, that ultimately God is overall working in the bigger plan of his will. He's saving the world. He's creating an eternal family. At the same time, in the midst of all of that, he's wanting to minister to your individual needs. And you may find yourself with things going on in your life. Hold on to the Lord because God does change things. Amen. So it's temporary. Point number one, Jeremiah 29, 10. If you could go back to that. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and causing you to return to this place. Before the bad even happens, God instructs them it's temporary. It has an end. 70 years. And then it's going to be over. Israel had been disobedient, but God had given a promise that what they would experience wouldn't last forever. 400 years later, Daniel, now an old man, remembered the promise God had given Jeremiah and he prayed to God. Dan, you got to remember the story of Daniel. As a teenage boy, he was ripped from his home in Jerusalem, forced to walk, because I know they didn't give him a horse, forced to walk, probably shackled. A distance like if we took off today and walked to San Antonio. That's how far Daniel and all them boys had to walk towards their Babylonian captivity. If you ever drove that, that isn't even comfortable, much less having to walk it. Daniel was ripped from his home and had to take that journey. He was thrown into a prison. He, he Later on, he was thrown into a pit. He was, he was told, uh, you, you know, he never... He was thrown into a pit of lions. He never once, uh, you know, bowed his knee to, to the enemy, to the king of the foreign land. But yet, even still, he is experiencing the pain of the fall. He's experiencing the pain of his people. But he remembered what the word of the Lord said. And as bad as it seems, it's not going to last forever. Some people may say, that's not true because I have experienced pain and circumstances that aren't temporary, preacher. You can't tell me that my pain's temporary because I've experienced things that aren't going to change. See, things like death. Things like tragedy and death. Many of us in this room have experienced that type of thing. And you would say, no, that's final. I'll never get that back. Let me tell you something. While that is true, we experience things like death. We experience painful circumstances like that. Even, even death has been swallowed up by the, by the victory of God. Amen. And if you know the Lord, hallelujah, you're going to raise on that day with him. Amen. And in the meantime, good news, God has enough grace to get you and I through. Even more than that, he has enough grace to heal us on the inside. Amen. You may never completely forget. You probably won't. But at the same time, God knows how to minister Amen. and to heal. I'm telling you, right. the situation is temporary. God knew the circumstances were temporary. I'm sorry, Daniel knew the circumstances were temporary because he knew that God wasn't a man. And he knew that God doesn't lie. Can you go to Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 real quick? Daniel 9, 1 through 6 says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So basically he was a Median, which was part of the Persian Empire too. They were together. But it's saying he, the Persian Empire defeated the Chaldeans, which is the Babylonians. And so now he's overseeing all of that. All right. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. I understood because what the book said. I read the book. And the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah the prophet. So we're getting near the end of the 70 years. And, and it says that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, 
keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spoke in your name to our kings and princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. A couple of things that I wanted to share with you real quick about this day that Daniel went to the books and saw that this whole situation was temporary. A couple of things I want to share with you whenever you're realizing the circumstance is temporary. Number one, God is going to accomplish his will. And if you want his will to affect your life, the first place to start is that you have to go to him in prayer. Amen. You have to go to the Lord in prayer. The scripture says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish the 70 years and that he went to the Lord in prayer and in sackcloth and in ashes. And he began to speak to the Lord about the situation. And you and I need to understand that when you're going through it, first thing I want you to remember is it's temporary. But the second thing I need you to know, sub point one under point number one is you need to go to the Lord in prayer when you find yourself in that temporary situation. Because I can say temporary 1,500 times today. When you're going through it, it's going to feel like an eternity. Right. Amen? So you have to remember to go to the Lord in prayer. Number two, Daniel approached the Lord with humility. Mm -hmm. He was in sackcloth and ashes. What does that mean? That's how the Jewish people used to mourn and repent. They would rip their clothes off and they'd cover themselves like with a burlap sack. And then they would take ashes and they would rub it all over their skin and in their hair. Why? Because it was just uncomfortable. <laughs> and I know that that's something physical and it seems silly to us. But true repentance has some discomfort connected yeah. to it. Yeah. But when you realize that you've really gone the wrong way and that you've transgressed God, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's supposed to be painful. It's not something, you understand what I'm getting at, and that's what they would do. He went, but he went to the Lord with humility. Not only did he cover himself with sackcloth and ashes, do you hear what he said? We have sinned. And I'm thinking to myself, I wrote it right there in my notes, but you stood strong. Daniel, what are you talking about? You didn't even eat the meat or drink the wine that they offered you. You said, no, give me vegetables because I don't want to transgress my God. You didn't even eat. You didn't bow down, Dan Daniel. You, you allowed them to put you in the, in the lion's den. No, he said, no, we have sinned because there's nobody on this earth. Other than the Lord Jesus himself, who never failed God. Amen. Right. Daniel, with humility, realizes, ain't none of us been right in all of this. We've all gone our own way. We've all transgressed your ways. First step is you got to go to the Lord in prayer whenever you realize you're in the midst of a temporary situation. But you got to also approach him with humility. Amen. Bear your heart open to him. Amen. And let him know. So just remember, it's temporary, but God can change it according to his will. Approach him with humility. And ask him to intervene. That was point number one. It's temporary. Number two, God thinks about you. I want you to know that. God thinks about you. Jeremiah 29, 11. The scripture says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God thinks about you. Amen? Not only does God think about you, but he knows the thoughts. That he thinks about you. And the reason that I say it this way is because if you're anything like me and you've ever been in one of those temporary situations that's full of chaos and confusion and pain and heartache, sometimes you begin to think you know what God's thinking about you. And you think he's thinking some real bad stuff. Lord, why are you thinking all this evil towards me? Lord, why do you want to destroy me? Don't tell God what he's thinking. God knows what he's thinking. And what he's thinking towards you is... Good and not evil. Amen. He's thinking he wants to give you some peace. Amen. And he thinks he's thinking he wants to give you a future that has hope in it. Amen. Amen. So not only does God think about you, but he knows his thoughts. God wants to give his people hope, not harm. It's the enemy of your soul that wants to make you think that God wants to destroy you or punish you. Are you saying that nothing bad's ever going to happen and that I can do whatever I want? Of course not. Matter of fact. If you go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, 
And then we'll go to verse 11 after that. But starting in Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 7, the scripture says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. What does the word chasten mean? It's, this is the word in the Greek. It's the best way I can think I can describe it. It's, if you wrote it in Greek, that's what it would look like. Padilla. Where do you think that word comes from? It's where we get pediatrics. It's in the training of a child. It, when you cha when the, Lord, the word chasten right there means like the training and upbringing of a child. It includes instruction. God desires to instruct us through his word, but he also not only does he chasten, he scourges. If you look that word up in the Greek, guess what it means? He scourges. <laughs> what does it mean to scourge? It means to put something on him. It means discipline. And, it, and discipline, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude here. I'm not going to go off on this. Discipline is supposed to hurt. Amen. What are you trying to say, preacher? You're trying to say you're supposed to, you need me to uh, beat my kid. I don't, it's up to you how you discipline your kids. I can tell you what the word of God says. I'm not here to tell nobody to spank their kids. I'll say it on video right now because I don't know how you're going to act when you get home. You might start hitting that kid all upside the head and throwing stuff at him. I didn't tell you to do that. I'm trying to tell you whatever choice of discipline you choose to use, it needs to hurt. What are you trying to say? Well, I mean, if you don't want to spank your kid, that's between you and them. But, but let me say this. You better rip something out of their life that's going to hurt. And what, their electronic device? Good. Well, don't just give it back 30 minutes later. No, make it hurt. Yeah. Remind them four days later. You ain't having it because you ain't acting right. Take control of your house. Yeah, Discipline them. Scourge them. Teach them who the boss is. Because if you don't, you're going to have a problem on your hands. Yeah. Amen. 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 We got to do our job. We got to train our children up. They don't know any better. Lord help us, right? Anyway, the, who the Lord loves, he chastens, he scourges every son whom he's going to receive. To receive means to take him up, to take him into his arms. The Lord wants to take each and every one of us up into his arm. He wants things to be right between us. He's gone through a lot to make things right between us. He's not going to give up on us. Amen. But we may not like it when we're going through it. Even though it's temporary, it hurts. He says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Right. I mean, a good dad is going to make things right. Amen. Verse 11 says this. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Instead, it's grievous. It's burdensome, sorrowful, and painful. That's what it means. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God's chastening produces something in our lives. God is desiring for you and I to come to a place where, where we line up with his will. Israel was not lining up with God's will. God allowed 70 years of captivity as temporary circumstance, yes, but a purposeful move to get their hearts to turn back towards him, amen, and to get their eyes off the world and the idolatry of the world. And sometimes you and I may not even realize it, but we still got ourselves connected to the world and the Lord is allowing chastening and scourging in our lives in order to turn our eyes away from what the world is offering and to put them squarely back on him. He's not going to quit. The word of God says, and if you endure, he won't quit, so you can't quit. Because if you quit, if you don't endure, then you don't get the end. What is that? The peaceable fruit of righteousness. God is producing righteousness in us. Amen? A lot of times people don't even understand. You know, Christianity ain't just showing up to church. I know you ain't supposed to pick, pick on people and poke them in the eyeball if you want them to come back next Sunday. I get all that. But, you know, just because you showed up to church on Sunday, I'm preaching to the preacher. But just because you church showed up on church on Sunday don't mean you don't mean you live in a Christian life. Amen. No, Christianity twenty four seven. Amen. Amen. And, and 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 guess what? So it's not just me showing up over here and going through some routine or some ritual, listening to this preacher preach, and he, you know, I used to get called out on Facebook. That's why I got rid of it. He, I don't like nobody screaming at me and veins popping out in his head and all this kind of stuff. Well, good man, go find another. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on you. That's just how that's how I am. I mean, I was excited and passionate back when I was in the world. So why not be excited and passionate for Jesus? Amen. One time my daddy was, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. I was in military school. I was playing freshman football. And dad 
drove down, the family drove down, and, uh, you know, so I was actually in a varsity game, it was a big deal, and uh, I can remember I shot the gap, I didn't know what happened, but I it was on defense. I shot the gap. I hit the quarterback and made him fumble the ball. We recovered the ball. And my dad did. He was all about football, right? He played football for UL and he's in the Hall of Fame over there. And he had just gotten some false teeth. <laughs> 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 and they said, my sister said, that he, he's like, that's right, man. And when he started hollering, dude, his teeth flew out of body. He smashed him out there and he stuck him back in his mouth. And he said something to my sister. He said, I'm about to give me a jerk chain on these things. <laughs> She was sitting at the table with him at the house, and she was talking about Jesus. And I was like, well, let me tell you something, though, girl. I think you can get a little bit too, uh, you know, too passionate about that. You need to calm down a little bit. She's like, well, Daddy, I remember that day at the football game when you went to Holland and your teeth came out your face. You sure were passionate about football. Why can't I get passionate about Jesus? That's what I say to the people that don't want people getting passionate about Jesus. They make you uncomfortable. another story. It's a funny one, but anyway. So, you know, Jesus, he, the Lord wants to chasten those whom he loves. He's, he's gonna, he wants us to become part of his, to receive of his righteousness. So that was the thing I wanted to say. Don't tell God what he's thinking, right? That's where I started. He's thinking about you and he knows what he's thinking. And what he's thinking is that he wants to give you something good, not something bad. His thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace, not evil. His thoughts towards you are a future hope. That's what the phrase means. And expected end means a future hope. So while you may be saying right now, it's really bad, preacher, and I don't feel no hope, you need to remember, like Daniel, that it's temporary and hope is on the way. Amen? Amen. Some point, number one, under God is thinking about you and he's thinking peace and future hope, he offers peace. I need you to know that. God is offering peace to humanity. It might not come the way, the way that you expected it to come, but I'm here to tell you this is the gospel right here. Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It's almost like God saying, I'll make a truce with you. And it don't even cost you a dime. I'm not asking nothing from you other than for you to give faith to what I'm doing and for you through faith and grace to hold on to what it is I'm offering. But this is what he offered. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now has he reconciled. He made peace through the blood of his cross. Before you knew Jesus you were alienated. And you were in the midst of wicked works. You were separated from the presence of God. But somebody somewhere told you the good news. Hallelujah. That God loved you. And that he had a plan of peace for you. And that the peace required the shedding of Jesus' blood. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And from the beginning in the garden, when he clothed them with the skins of an animal, to the end when he turned and he saw a slain lamb, God has been about one thing and one thing only, giving the world Jesus, allowing Jesus to die on the cross, his blood to be shed, for you to reciprocate or to give back to God, taking your free will of faith and placing it on his plan. Not your plan, not the preacher's plan. God's plan. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when you did that, oh, hallelujah, that precious blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins cleansed you, made you whole, saved you. The Holy Ghost moved inside of you. He changed you. He cleansed you. He made you righteous. Now you can have a relationship with God. And where there is grace, yes. there is peace. Yes. That's how peace works. Peace with God Sometimes it makes no sense to the logical mind. That's right. Matter of fact, there's a scripture out of Philippians that says a peace that surpasses understanding. It don't make any sense. Why? Because the situation sometimes hasn't even changed. Yet God breathes peace. Just shows up. It's one of these situations somebody was sharing with me the other day. And, and you know, we talk about that all the time. Sometimes you're going to find yourself in situations and you want these things to be changed. And you can keep on trying to change them. You can keep on doing it in your own strength. Go ahead. 
Go ahead, mama. Go ahead, papa. Now go ahead, preacher. <laughs> Try to change it. Fix it yourself. See what happens. Frustration and confusion. Amen. Chaos. Yeah. Catastrophe. Why? Because you want to just mess it up. Yeah. But when you step back and you say, you know what, Lord? It ain't easy. But I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, say, Lord, please take care of this. And there's been a couple of circumstances I'm not going to get into where some people were dealing with some stuff with their kids. Two different people in the church. And you know when they came to the realization? I shared with one of them for sure. I'm like, you, you're going to be able to change this. But one thing you better do, you better let that kid know how much you love them. You better not give up on them. You better, you better let not be and you better tell them that you love them. And, and guess what? Put it in the Lord's hand. And if you'll do that, I'm telling you, it, it'll get better. Amen. And sure enough, the Lord knows how to work out things. Amen. Amen? And, 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 and so what I'm trying to say is, is that that's just one example. Things in our lives that are going on that we can't change and we want to try to grab a hold of. But in the meantime, you can't change it and you're going to trust the Lord. He will give you peace. That's right. right. One of them, the person said, I, I said it that day. I can't do it. The Lord's going to have to fix it in the very next day. Their situation changed. Sometimes the Lord's just, you know, I, I told him, I told him yesterday. I said, I know that this is the wrong way to say it. And I'm not trying to be irreverent. But it's almost like God like playing games, like not playing games, but joking. Like uh, like you see that he's got personality is what I'm saying. Oh, you're going to finally trust me. Okay. Bink. <laughs> I'll change it for you tomorrow when you woke up. It was already changed. Got a phone call. It's done. Isn't that something? You pray. The, the body is running this way. Lord, I ain't got no help out here. I need some help from you. Now the body is running this way. Camp right back in spot. Now go walk out there call the entire thing back up. Amen. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah, all the time, amen? All right, God wants to bring, he's bringing peace. He brought it through his son. Peace with God creates peace on earth, creates peace in the heart, and where there is grace, there is peace. He went so far to give you peace that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. This always was his plan for his people. He told his people through Jeremiah, even before they were all in Babylon, I have good thoughts toward you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bring you back. Because I'm going to use you. Don't tell me that I don't know what I'm thinking. Your little mind can't even imagine the things that I have planned. I'm going to bring you back. And my son's going to be born. And he's going to die. And he's going to reconcile my people to me. And there's going to be peace. That was the first thing. God's offering peace. God's offering, second thing, a future hope. Amen. He says, I have a plan for you, Israel. I'm just speaking the way God would talk to his people. I have a plan for you, Israel. Messiah is going to come from you and save the world. But even then, I'm not done because I'm going to establish my throne in you and rule from you because you are my people and I am your God. God's not done with Israel. It looks like a mess over there. But I'm here to tell you that there's coming a day when God is going to rule and reign from that place. He promised it in his word and it's going to happen. Yes. I have a plan for you, Christian. Uh, because my son came and died for you, he saved you, and I'm going to give you grace through the pain and the heartache and the hopeless situations, but I'm not done there. I have a future hope for you because you're going to rule and reign with me. You're going to be kings and priests with me. Revelation 5.10 says that that's what he did. Revelation 5.10 says he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's, that's the future. God's, there's a hope. There's a future hope is what I'm here to tell you. Can I tell you that your situations on this earth are always going to change exactly the way that you want them to? I can't tell you that. I'd be a lying preacher. Can I tell you that so many times whenever we put it in the Lord's hands, He does change it. He does change the circumstances. But even if sometimes you have to deal with some physical things on this earth, guess what? In the end... There's a future of hope. Amen. There's a future of hope because there's an eternity, amen, to live with him. It's temporary. He's thinking of you. That was point number one and point number two. Point number three, when your will and his will collide, things start happening. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Jeremiah 29, 12. When your will and his will collide, things start happening. It says, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. Man, I was, as I was reading that again, I was like, Lord, you're going to hearken unto me? I, I don't know, you know, I, 
when you come to the end of a temporary circumstance and it's had its way in your life and you begin to see his will and your will lines up with his will and you begin to pray according to his will, he says that he will listen and respond. You may not remember this, but there's been many a times I used to make when we first started the church, I, that word hearken just kept sticking in my spirit. Because the meaning of the word, word hearken in the English language, when you look it up originally in the Greek and so the same translators are translating the Hebrew, it doesn't just have the idea of being able to listen. It doesn't just mean that your auditory, your auditory faculties are functioning properly. It actually describes an obedience to the word spoken or response, if you will. God speaks, we respond. And so that's how I was preaching it because I was talking about how Jesus said you got to hearken unto me. Or the, the people refused to hearken. In other words, God was speaking, but they didn't want to respond and listen. And that's the same thing with the gospel for each and every one of our lives. Amen? The gospel goes forward. We hear it. The question is, will we hearken? Will we respond? So you can listen to it all day long, but if there's no response, then we're not really in God. We're not doing God's will. In this situation, God said, I'm going to hearken unto you. I'm like, and I sort of think, well, I know he's not trying to say I'm going to be obedient to you. That's not what, but no, he's going to respond. I'm going to respond to you. You're going to speak, and I'm going to respond. Why? Why? Because you shall call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Previously, before that, he said, you're going to seek me with all of your heart, and you're going to pray. There's something about that temporary circumstance that turns your eyes away from where you were before and puts them back on the Lord. It breaks your heart. It brings you to a place of surrender. And you turn to the Lord, and you begin to seek his face for his will, and he says, now I'm going to hearken unto you. When I hear your will lined up with my will, I'm going to hearken unto you. In, in this case, God says he will respond. If you go to John chapter 14, verse 13, this is Jesus talking. He said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That was John 14, but now we're going to 1 John. We're going to go to 1 John Chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Because, you know, that scripture I just read to you in John, that's one of them ones that, the, I'm not trying to pick on, so forgive me. <laughs> but then again, I am. <laughs> that's what some of those word of faith preachers would say. Jesus said it right there, whatsoever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it. So, that's your word, Lord. You said you're going to do whatever I ask for. I want this. I mean, dude, I'm telling you, they want it. Better suits, better cars, better houses. I mean, you know, and they just want that stuff to fall out of the sky. Because, look, they ain't over there picking up an extra shift. I'm just being honest with you. They talk about sow your seed. Yeah. A seed uh, you're going to receive a harvest. Well, the Bible's full of seed and harvest time. But the majority of that stuff doesn't have nothing to do with money. It has to do with the kingdom of God. It has to do with souls being one for the kingdom of God. Right. Plant your seed. And you're going to get your harvest like you're in like a, some spiritual lottery. I'm going to send you a check. And I'm not saying people there, probably somebody in the room that can say, hold on a second, preacher. I gave old such and such Murdoch 50 bucks and I got 250 back. Okay, well, okay, that's fine. Might have been the devil too. Uh-oh, I said it. Yeah, might have been the devil too to make you keep holding on to some false doctrine. Think he ain't can't do it? Don't tell me he can't do it. He took Jesus up on a mountaintop and he showed him the kingdoms of the earth. And he said, you bow down to me and I'll give it to you. Right. The kings of the earth have been receiving power from the enemy for a long time. Yeah. What are you trying to say? I'm not going any further with any names that I've mentioned. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but I am going to say, just because you got $250 return on your $50 deposit doesn't mean it was definitely the Lord. And it definitely doesn't mean that that person is preaching the gospel. Amen. All right. That's another story. First John chapter 5. Because this is how the prayer needs to be prayed. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, his will. <laughs> he heareth us. Yeah. Amen. Same author, John, writing another letter. Probably the Holy Spirit's like, okay, I told you to write it that way the first time. I'm just saying. <laughs> I need you to, you're going to go ahead and correct the situation. Not correct it, sorry. Give a little bit of further understanding for my people. I, I, I wanted it written that way the first time. I want you to write it this way this time. And I want them to understand. No. 
you got to ask according to his will. God moves according to his will, not our will. Amen? And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions, means requests that we desire him when we pray him according to his will. All right. Number four. This is it. Number four. You get a fresh start with God. Amen? Amen. In the temporary situation, there's a, I got to tell you, there's a hope for the future. And in the temporary situation, when it's all said and done, you need to understand that God is offering a fresh start. Jeremiah 29, 14. The Lord says, and I will be found of you. So when you come to this place at the end of yourself and you seek me with all of your face and you turn to me and pray, I'm going to hearken unto you and I'm going to be found of you. You ever been in a situation where you're looking for the Lord and you can't seem to find him? God says, when, you, when your will and my will collide, you're going to find him. Yes. Says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. The very place that you used to be, I'm going to bring you right back there. I'm going to give you a fresh start. Amen. Praise God. You're going to, you're going to get a do-over. You're going to get a, you're going to get a new start. Many times that's where we are in life, right? We've gone our own way. We've run from the Lord. And, and guess what? When we come back to the Lord and we give our heart to Him, He can give us a fresh start. He wants to let you know we can start from here. We can, we can move forward. That Ultimately, God's plan for Israel was that He was going to bring them back. You know, corporately, I've told you all this before. When I preach Old Testament, I'm looking at the nation of Israel as the older brother and Christian is the younger brother. And the older brother Israel, corporately, but I'm kind of like trying to compile them into like this one person. It helps me see it a little bit better. Israel's just walking around trying to serve God and he's making mistakes. He's making mistakes and he's failing God. But then God works with him, puts him in some captivity for a little, little time out for a little while. And then he comes to a place where he realizes he failed God. He turns his heart back to the Lord. And guess what? Same thing for Christian. Christian's walking around, gives his heart. He's the people of God. That's what we have in common. We're the people of God. Two, two testaments, two covenants, but guess what? One plan. We're the people of God. Amen. One plan, I'm going to give them Messiah. The second plan, they need to receive Messiah. And guess what? They need to follow me. And, and I'm here to tell you that corporately, God's plan for Israel was, I'm going to bring you back. where I'm. Now, many of those people died. Many of those people went on to be with the Lord and never saw the promise. But nevertheless, God stayed true to his promise for Israel. I'm going to bring you back to the land. Why? Because I'm going to give the world Messiah. Jesus is going to be born. Amen. And he's going to die for our sins to set us free. He's promised them to start over. He gives that to us too in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, Amen. all things are become new. There's a, whole lot of, there's a whole lot of meaning to that scripture. When I first got saved, <clears throat> that was one of the first scriptures that they preached to me. I could, that was, you know, look, the, when I first got saved, people probably didn't, anybody may not remember, but. My mother-in-law probably would, because she's made comments before. Dude, almost every service, I was up at the altar. <laughs> I mean, this went on for months. <laughs> I was like, I was a bad dude, bro. Like, I messed up a lot. People don't even want to come to the altar anymore. I got to admit to you. Like, I don't even ask people, okay, if you want to get saved, just receive Jesus right there. Back in the day, they're like, Sister Tut, she was like, I feel it in my bones. Somebody in here needs to give their heart to Jesus. Come now. Waste no more time. Run to the altar and get your heart free. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I got a big old long hair smiling behind my back. I'm like, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you, Lord. And every service, man, I'd be up there. And one day they finally like, you know, Matt, you're a new creature in Christ. <laughs> well, I didn't even know what that meant. Twelve years later, I still didn't know what it meant. I'm telling you what, I'm here to tell you this morning what it means so that you don't have to go on wondering. With the day that you gave your heart to Jesus, in the mind of God, we've been teaching Romans chapter 6 and 7 on Wednesday nights. I think you really need to try to make it. But anyway, that's, yeah, I know you, we're all busy. <laughs> On the day that you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a miracle happened in the spiritual realm. 
God's eternal plan that had been taking place from the time he clothed him with the skins of an animal had finally become manifest in the fact that Jesus was born and walked on the earth in sinless flesh and offered that sinless life on the cross in payment for the penalty of your sin. And on that day, hallelujah, when you heard the gospel and by your faith you received God's plan, a miracle happened in the spiritual realm. What happened? The Bible, whole thing in Jesus, the Bible says God baptized you. It means he immersed you. There wasn't no water the day you got saved because water baptism doesn't save you. Faith in the plan of God is what saves you. God took you and he immersed you into Jesus. I'm going to keep saying this every Sunday. And in the mind of God, you rush back on a chronological calendar, whoo, 2,000 years. And in God's mind, you were in Jesus when he died on the cross. Your death was his death. His death was your death. You became one in union with him, and you died with him. And in God's mind, you didn't only die with him, you were buried with him. That's your old man, born of Adam in the first birth. Now you got a second birth. That's why you got to be born again. I was a Christian for 12 years preaching one time at the church in Franklin, probably my second time to preach over there. I already had all kind of revelation. I'm over there talking about a, uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus about being born again. And all of a sudden I realized, born, I'm born again? <laughs> I realized what the word, what he was trying to say. I was born the first time physically in Adam, born in sin. And now I've been born again in Jesus. And in the mind of God, I literally died with Jesus at the cross. I was there. to newness of life, I too should walk in newness of life. Jesus resurrected physically. I resurrected spiritually. The presence of God now is living in me. Have you been born again? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Those who are in Christ. Don't forget that. In Christ. <laughs> I, I know we used to write it on the board all the time. In Christ. In Him. In whom? You got a position change. He put you in him. He put you in him and you became one with him. It's a prepositional phrase that has a whole lot of meaning. Now you're in him. You're in him. He's in you. He's in the Father. Lord Larson used to call it, call it the divine entanglement. You're in him. You're covered in him. His righteousness covers you. His blood covers you. You're no longer guilty, but it's not because you're perfect. It's because he was perfect. Amen. A gift was given to you. It's yes. called righteousness, Romans 5, 17. Yes. A gift of righteousness. What a beautiful plan. You became one with him and you died with him. And, and, and you need to, I'm not going to shut up because you need to get a revelation of that. Amen. I need to get a revelation of that. The old man died. A new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You might not hear the word cross in that passage of Scripture. But if you can't see it, then, then it's okay. I'm not picking on you. You just don't understand. Because you ain't got in Christ without the cross. You can't get there without Calvary. That's right. You can't get inside of Jesus without dying to your life of Adam and being resurrected to Christ. In him, there's a new creature that's created. A new man. Old things are passed away. God's not holding you to account for all of that stuff in the past. Oh, the enemy, he's going to keep on whispering in your mind, in your ear, all your failures, all your faults. I'm here to tell you, you're a new creature. When the miracle of Romans 6 happens to you, you become a new creation in Christ. Your old life is gone. Your old sins are gone. You're a new creation with a new life and a new start. God told Israel, I'm going to bring you back. Just right from where I took you from. And I got good news this morning for the church. He is making a new creation out of you. Can you go to Romans 12 too, real quick? And we're going to close with this. So if I'm a new creation, then why in the world do I keep on acting this way? <laughs> I don't know if you ever asked that, but I know. I, and I mean, sometimes it's not even really the bad stuff. Thank God I ain't like that long haired dude that, that night. But... Lord knows I still got issues, man. <laughs> I need God to help me, man. You know? And y'all do too. That's right. Thank you, sister. That's right. We know. We got attitudes. <laughs> I might not know it all, but your husband or your wife do. <laughs> y'all 
Y'all stay away from my wife. Don't be trying to pick her brain on stuff. Y'all don't need to know all that. Like Brother Larson used to say, you got your own buffet to eat off of. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. All right. The question that we have to ask ourselves, if we're new creations, then why do we act like the old? The world has an influence on us. In addition, we have lived so long like the old that we often revert to that old behavior. But God has a message in this verse that we need to hear. You know, that's one of the things that the Lord revealed to me after he began to set me free from some of the bondages that had plagued me for so long. I was like, Lord, what? I mean, such, I couldn't get free for so long. He's like, son, okay, so you ran up there with your old long-haired self and you bowed your knee to me and you gave your heart to me and it was real. I mean, you felt the cement bag roll off your back. It was real. The burden was removed. You had been living like Adam for all your life. And you think overnight all of a sudden you're going to start living like my son? No, it doesn't happen that way. There's a process, sanctification, which means to be separated and to be made holy by, unto God, is a process that takes place. Where the, the miracle that's already happened in your heart becomes manifested in your life. It becomes manifested in the way you talk, the way you think, the way you handle stuff with you, the places you, your feet bring you, the stuff you touch. You understand what I'm saying? Your members, it takes time. For that process to take place. The Holy Spirit's working on the inside of us. And he's changing us. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says. Be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the word conformed means to be molded. So the word of God saying don't let the world mold, mold you. I could go on and on and preach about this kind of stuff. For a long time, and I'd probably get some people mad, and you know, and I'm, that's never really my point, but but I will I will say it. You know, when we listen to worldly music, back whenever I first got saved, this is what happened. I'm just being honest with you. I got you for a couple more minutes, just ain't done. When I used, first got saved, this is what they would say: "You better quit listening to that worldly music." And I was thinking, okay, I don't really know why, but I guess. And so, if you say so, preacher. And so I'll find myself, but what, this is what I'd do. I'd hit that little seek button on my radio. <laughs> I'm going to find some, something good, you know, and then go through. I'm like, oh, man, I remember that song. Because, yeah, that was whenever I was dating that girl, and that was her favorite song. And, you know, and I'd let it go through the, through the next thing. Oh, yeah, that one right there. I remember that, that rock and roll crew. I remember that moment. We were at a party one time. And so, but I would act like I wasn't really listening to it, but I was just like I'd be having all these flashbacks. And my flesh liked it. My flesh like remembering all of that stuff, so I kind of like still want to listen to it. I'm not picking on you if your flesh likes secular music. That's not what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to say is this, is that the music will conform you. Yeah. The music will mold you. What are you talking about, preacher? You're getting on my nerves. I don't want to hear that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that it will mold you. What are you talking about? Well, I'm going to give you some examples real quick. One of them songs I used to like, I don't know why. I think it was just the weirdest thing when that guy Vince Neal with Motley Crue came out with that blonde hair. I don't know if y'all remember that or not. But I was like, look at this dude, man. He's pretty wild. But they used to, and I used, I've used this example before. They used to have this song, and I used to love this song. I don't even know why because they didn't even drink whiskey. But it was song about, I'm going to take a swig of whiskey and I'm going to jump into the saddle with you. And I mean, I knew what the guy was talking about. I was like, yeah, man, let's, let's party. Well, guess what? When you listen to that stuff over, that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Amen. I'm going to take a swig of whiskey and judge Jesus. ain't swigging no whiskey. Jesus ain't jumping in the saddle with nobody. He's sitting on top of a donkey, lowly and, and humble and coming into town to give his life as a sacrifice. You know, and I, I use these ones that I remember because I don't know too much about too many songs anymore. And I'm not trying to get too graphic because sometimes I hear stuff in the gym. I'm like, dang, is that what she's saying right there? Yeah, that's what she's saying. But, you know, there was that one country song that was on the top of the list a while back. Because you think country's pretty safe. But he said, I think I'm going to sit down on this pier right here and I'm going to have myself a beer. I mean, it doesn't seem like that bad if you're, you know, if you're an old, good old boy. And, but guess what? Sitting down on the pier right here and having yourself a beer is not going to fix the problem in the circumstances. Yeah. But yet the world will say, hey, this is how we deal with this, right? Uh, you know, you know uh, there's a tear in my beer and I'm crying over you, dear. You know, well, what? The pain of a, a broken relationship the message that it's sending, the world is conforming us into its way of thinking. The message it's sending us is this. 
when you have a problem, like, you know, Adele, she's going through these relationships and she's hurting. And so she says, hello, I'm coming from the other side and I'm wanting to, you know, I'm still here, still loving you and all this. Well, when you feel that pain, you need to listen to her. She's going to speak some wisdom to you. You know, she ain't got no wisdom to offer nobody. Right. And guess what? The, the tear in your beard, what? Shoot, I might just drink a beer and numb the pain a little bit. Problem is, when you wake up in the morning, the pain's still there. That's right. You need, that's conforming to the world. It's the world's message that's trying to give you their wisdom to try to tell you that this is how we can correct this situation. This is how we can numb this pain. That ain't gonna fix nothing. That's, right. that's the, the world's trying to mold you. Hollywood's trying to mold us. It's trying to mold our children. The Disney Channel's trying to mold our children. Oh, you're a crazy preacher. I might be, but I'm here to tell you they're trying to mold us. That's right. It is getting more and more acceptable for homosexual people to make out on TV. For, for, and, and they're doing this kind of stuff in the school at a young age. They're molding the behaviors in the mind of our children. I'm here to tell you that it's not okay for homosexuals to be married together. How do you know that? Because Romans chapter 1 says it. I've been thinking to myself, if somebody comes up to me and asks me, so what do you think about, it? and I know that they're homosexual, right? I mean, they're going to try to set me up sooner or later. It's coming. I mean, is it okay if I still believe what Romans chapter 1 says? That's yes. right. Yeah. I sure hope so. I heard that Trump just recently got some bill signed. Praise God. I hope it does give us some protection at least for eight years or four years or whatever. You know, is it okay if I just say, hey, Romans 1 says, and guess what? He don't just say that about the homosexual. He says that about the fornicator. He says that about the liar. He says that, you understand what I'm saying? We want to pick on the homosexual, but the reality of it is, is that each and every one of us have been guilty. But what the world is trying to do is conform our mind, mold us to its way of thinking. The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let it mold you, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation is the same word that's transliterated as transfigured. When Jesus was transfigured on the mount, what does it mean? It means something is in you and it needs to be manifested out of you. What's in you? The presence of God. The new creator. The fresh start. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in you. The presence of God lives in you. Hallelujah. And now you need to have a renewed mind. And it don't just mean reading five chapters a day. It means understanding what the Word of God is communicating. Now the Word of God is conforming and molding your mind instead of the world. Amen. And as the renewed mind, hallelujah, begins to understand things the way God does. And God says that what's in you is a new creature. And on the inside of you is the presence of God. Let that come out. Amen. Amen. Let that be manifest in the midst of your life.